I'm Scott Snibby, and this is A Skeptic's Path to Enlightenment, where we explore how Buddhist ideas fit into the lives of ordinary people to make our lives happier, our relationships stronger, and even create a better world. Ten years ago, Dr. Catherine McLean conducted the first scientific study of the combined effects of psychedelics with meditation. The encouraging results of the study showed the long-term beneficial effects these substances can have on our concentration, emotion regulation, openness, well-being, and happiness. In our conversation, I learned what psychedelics have in common with meditation and how they can complement one another. Catherine also shared when psychedelics aren't useful or even when they can be harmful. And she offers careful advice as to when these substances might be of benefit and when they aren't. Catherine McLean, it's a pleasure to have you on A Skeptic's Path to Enlightenment. I'm really looking forward to our conversation and I appreciate your making the time for it. Thank you. You have an impressive background in Buddhism, psychotherapy, and psychedelics. I, before I get into asking you about research, I was just curious about your own life experience with meditation and psychedelics. What drew you to this area of research in the first place? Uh, when I arrived in college, I had pursued a kind of classic, somewhat privileged educational path. So I was valedictorian. I was captain of the track team. I had kind of ticked off all the boxes of achievement. And then when I got to college, I was introduced to the really harmful effects of binge drinking and also injury. So my body stopped working the way it had up until that point. And after a number of years of experimenting with different substance approaches to you know, happiness or hedonism didn't quite work out the way I planned, I actually found meditation through a rock climbing instructor at Dartmouth. And these Bhutanese uh, monks were living in the town next to Hanover, New Hampshire. And so he took me to one of their sits. And it was the first time I'd ever sat in a room with people meditating quietly. And that thread, I think, convinced me that maybe meditation had at least as much to show me as psychedelics. Thankfully, I got a really solid foundation in mindfulness and meditation before I had to embark on what is actually very complex and difficult work, which is sitting for people trying to understand psychedelic experiences. That's what I and I think a lot of people are most aware of your work is that you were a lead researcher on Johns Hopkins' famous study on the combined effects of psilocybin and meditation. I was actually accepted into that study. That's a funny thing because I'm a, I'm a Tibetan Buddhist practitioner, and normally we take a vow not to take any intoxicants, but I actually asked my teacher, I said, oh, would it be okay? And, and of course, like as a 70s, 60s person, he had taken lots of drugs in the past. So he actually said it would be fine. But then it, um, I just wasn't able to do it because of the travel. Oh, wow. So I've, I've actually never taken any psychedelics, which is a kind of a funny story because my, my dad wanted me to take them so much that I, <laughs> I rebelled and didn't. I've heard, I've heard of people like you. It's like the only way to rebel is to be very, very straight and sober. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's, I was really into math and physics, you know, and I was telling him what I was learning and he was trying to build perpetual motion machines and things. I said, you know, like thermodynamics. And he got kind of mad at me. He's like, you need to take LSD as soon as possible. <laughs> so I never took it. Um, but I'm really, really interested in the connection um, and the benefits of this com combination of meditative practice and psychedelics. Sure. So there were kind of two parallel studies happening at the same time. The first one was with naive meditators. So people who had not really meditated before and had maybe had a handful to zero psychedelic experiences. And my mentor, Roland Griffiths, was very particular about this. He first and foremost wanted to make sure that people's intentions were sincere and that their they wouldn't push back at us against meditating every day. And so we already had very highly motivated people in the study um, and interested in a spiritual outcome. This wasn't mental health care. This wasn't therapy. This wasn't trying to fix them. So before I 
explain what happened to them, I also want to say that we are also studying people with a lot of meditation experience and no psychedelic experience. And we wanted to understand what happens if you've been meditating for decades and you really understand the mind and you have an ethical foundation, a very spiritual life, and then you get to drop this very different kind of fuel in the water and see what what happens. It's the opposite experiment of what the a lot of the hippies did, which was put all of the LSD in the pool first and then try to swim, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's the study that I had signed up for because I it was seemed kind of unique. Yeah. Yeah. And I was I was more fascinated in a way by the experienced meditators and what would happen. Um, not because I thought they were already enlightened, but I thought that psilocybin would expose the parts of their practice that were in hiding. Like the parts of their practice that maybe they were very skilled at not practicing, not noticing, not, you know, saying like, ooh, what's that part of me that is resisting in some way? So just kind of like keep that in the back of your mind. Back to our naive meditators. What we found was actually kind of surprising. So if you have a high dose, psilocybin experience and you're very well prepared you've been meditating every day for a month ahead of time you have great guides and support people in the room you get help afterward just having that mystical spiritual experience on psilocybin is more powerful than a daily meditation practice for six months now how did we determine that well we looked at people who uh, started meditating every day, but we tricked them and only gave them the placebo until the very end of the study. And those people, after they got the psilocybin, basically looked like the people who had gotten it at the beginning. And so you could say, oh, well, meditation doesn't matter. And I think that's not actually the conclusion at all. The conclusion is that among people who are already highly motivated, meditating every day and have the intention to develop a spiritual practice, that psilocybin is still very powerful. It's not, hmm. it's not something that only shocks or surprises. And, you know, as a now, you know, 15 years later, what I would say is I think they, they go well together, psilocybin and meditation. And we're still just beginning to understand how they go well together. And I think that's going to be the most exciting part. Hmm. Obviously, not every person who's taken LSD is a highly evolved spiritually. You know, I think, you know, we've each met many different types of people over the years, including people who have, you know, it's numbed them to life and they, you know, they're, they aren't that in, engaged with themselves or life. So what's the difference? How do you use these substances in conjunction with meditation or in a spiritual way? There was a point in my own practice where I had a therapist point out that I the moment that I was leaving my body while I was having a, a big emotion. And I made the connection that I was also practicing leaving my body while I meditated. And, you know, I don't have a daily uh, mentor. I don't, I don't live at a retreat center. So I would say it's hard to hide this from a really good mm -hmm. meditation teacher if they see you every day. But if you're just going for a retreat here, it's kind of easy to practice disconnecting from big emotions and feelings in our body. And so I think psychedelics are similar. For some people, they're a really great escape. They help us get away from our thoughts, our feelings, our, um, our past memories. It's a nice little um, ticket out of here. You know, you kind of go on your journey and you come back and the world is a little bit different for a while, like when you go on a nice vacation. So, you know, it does change you, but it's temporary. And in the same way that I changed how I was approaching meditation after the therapist pointed that out, like, hey, you're trying to hide from these big emotions. I think psychedelics can be used to take you deeper into your somatic existence, your, you know, your body. Um, I'm not sure that this is necessarily how most psycho psychedelic therapists are being trained. Some of them are to prevent dissociation, but I think it's, um, it's built in as kind of a risk factor for psychedelics. How did you measure those things in both the types of studies, like how the experiences were beneficial, how they were powerful, how you compare one to the other? Well, one of the things we did was after every session where someone ingested psilocybin, it came in a form of a pill. At the end of that eight hours, before they went home, they filled out a bunch of questionnaires. And you can imagine this is the worst thing you want to do right after a big trip. But 
for some of the people, they actually enjoyed it because it helped them reflect and remember the things that they had learned throughout the day. So we had their very uh, fresh impressions of the experience. And uh, one of those questionnaires was a mystical questionnaire. And those 30 items predict whether you had a classic unity experience. So a connection with all things, usually a dropping away of time and space. It's very positive. It's blissful. Uh, and it's hard to describe to others unless you've experienced it yourself. There's a big debate right now about whether the way we're measuring mystical experience at Hopkins is um, is inclusive to all the types of experiences people can have and call them spiritual. And our answer would be no, of course it's not. It's measuring a particular type of experience. We tried to see if it predicted whether they meditated more. It didn't, <laughs> unfortunately. And, um, and we also wanted to see if there were any negative consequences. So one month later, three months later, six months later, um, were people's anxiety levels higher? Were their depression scores higher or lower? These were all people who are very healthy to begin with, but, you know, we all have anxiety. And what we found is that transiently, so within a few days after the session, you might see a little uptick in things like headache, um, anxiety, um, just kind of unease, not really sure how to get back into your everyday routine. But the long-term effects are mostly positive. So at six months, people are saying, it's easier for me to forgive others. I can understand and empathize with others better. Um, even people's uh, loved ones and friends who we called to get uh, independent reports co corroborated what people were telling us. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not just narcissistically saying, like, I'm a great person now. You know, they're other, the people around them are kind of saying, wow, they've really changed for the better. Um and there were very few tests that we gave them that could show either behaviorally or in the brain that something positive had changed. And so that's a lot of the research that's happening now. It's fascinating. And it's just the beginning. When I've talked to my teacher about certain powerful mystical experiences I had in meditation, and, and friends of mine too, when they go to their teachers, in, at least in our Tibetan Buddhist tradition, we almost always get the same response, which is, okay, that's nice. But you want to work on your, you know, your behavior. You want to become a good person. You want to become kinder, more patient, more generous, more content, and let go of anger and craving and so on. So I wonder if you could reflect on that a little. It sounded like you were aware of that and you were trying to measure it. Um, do you have thoughts on how successful that was and how it can be, how we can go more towards measuring, you know, ethics, kindness, yeah. and on, so on? I have a lot of thoughts about it. I think Many Americans who are seeking out both meditation, maybe less so, but certainly psychedelics, are coming from a place of profound self-centered suffering. Mm -hmm. And I think that psilocybin is a great tool for getting you through that initial material, like your own stuff. And it will show you your stuff. And the person can say, okay, I get who I am. This is the life I want to live. These are the changes I'm willing to make, but I'm still, I still care about myself first and foremost. And I'm not judging that at all. Many people, it's still way better to be a happy self-centered person than a mean self-centered person. Like, so I yeah. think it's important to say that, right? Yes. I often say, you know, even narcissists need a spiritual path too, you know? Yeah. It's my, my, yeah. yeah. So if, if that's what psilocybin and some of these other medicines can offer people is just relief from a profound level of suffering mm. that they can be a little bit happier. And in that way, I believe less harmful to others and themselves. Great. But then there's this real uh, jumping off point for others, which is saying, okay, I've now kind of sorted my own stuff. I can, I can see now. And now I'm starting fresh without being so hyper-focused on what's happened to me, me being the victim, my life, my biography. And I think that that's when the ethics kind of become a lot more important. And then you say, okay, now what's my intention with this? Do I want to get rich? Do I want to patent these medicines and, and be a savior to a lot of people? Or do I just want to be more kind? Do I want to fight for, you know, um, a cause I believe in? So there's so many options. And I, th I think it's, it's worth saying that psychedelics don't differentiate. I don't believe. 
you can take them and develop a pretty unethical platform. At the same time, what the plant medicine folks would say is they do have a preference toward ethics and kindness. And it's a, again, it's a debate, you know, do, do these chemicals um, have a preference for working with people who want to help others and help themselves? Or is it just a free for all? Can you do whatever you want with these things? Even meditation can be used for nefarious purposes. Um, you know, the military uses mindfulness in a couple of different ways. One to help people over PTSD and, and problems like that. The other to train soldiers to focus very sharply so their hands don't shake while they're killing somebody. So, right. you know, it, so meditation itself isn't, um, and there's, you know, a long history of that. Of people, And you see it also in some of the ways, like very powerful people now kind of brag about meditating <laughs> and how it helps them focus and, you know, right. be more effective, but not necessarily be more effective at doing good, just more effective at whatever they're doing. I mean, I, I really have been reflecting on this, especially yeah. recently. And we have all these scientists working for a cure for cancer. We have we have vaccines. We have so much advancement in healthcare. And yet, do we have any medicine or any approach that can tackle the self-centered violence that is at our at the root of our human nature? No, we don't. I mean, you could ask the question, maybe MDMA or maybe psilocybin, if people are turned toward the right direction. But you know, it's hard to predict. I mean, like we said, people can go in whatever direction. Once you're free of your own trauma, you could be a bigger jerk or you could be a lot more kind and helpful. And is that ethical dimension the one you've taken in the, the next steps in your career? Well, one of the reasons I left Hopkins was to work on my own stuff so that I would be less self-centered and less harmful to myself and others. And one of the things I describe in my book is a turning point on a meditation retreat where I decided to take a vow of nonviolence. So after that retreat, it became much harder for me to do my work as a psychedelic professional. And what I say is that there are a lot of people, I think with good intentions, who um, have no concerns about having people pay a lot of money to get psychedelic care, um, are not concerned with charging lots of money for therapy, um, really are not that interested in what happens to people a long time afterward. It's just, can we help people right now, whatever the cost? And I kept finding myself at odds with some of my colleagues and saying, well, what's the bigger implication of this? You know, what kind of support are we providing this person six months down the road? And so when my friend Chris Kelly, out of, um, it was actually out of concern for a dear friend of ours who went really off the rails after a psychedelic experience, we said, wouldn't it be amazing to have a sangha, a community of practitioners who could be a safety net for folks like this? And so Psychedelic Sangha, which was created maybe five years ago, four years ago, um, is, is finally maturing into that. And I would say that the last conversation I had with Chris, we were talking about lineage and we were talking about ethics. So like, what are we doing here? We're actually not doing the thing that psychedelic psychotherapy is doing. We're asking different questions and we're asking how can we be of service to each other? Not just, can I get happier, but can I be of service? Can I help others? And so I would say that it's taken a very happy um, path, although there were many points where I might have been um, like seduced by the systems that exist, you know, capitalism, uh, fancy careers. And so, again, I think now the Buddhist um, ethos of like, it's not about how glamorous your life is. It's not about being a celebrity. It's about do you care about the person next to you? You know, would you put up with a little unpleasantness to help someone? Like these like very simple questions. Mm. Can you talk about a specific example from someone in your sangha, I guess including yourself if you like, of how that community has benefited them? There are a few elders in the community who've been practitioners for a long time, have a very spiritual life, but um, live alone, are facing... Um, more and more you know, either illnesses or challenges health-wise. And what we noticed in our community is that we have a lot of young people with a lot of energy and resources. And we have these elders who, even though they have a very strong spiritual practice, maybe don't have the physical people in their vicinity who could help them carry out the things they care about at the end of their life. 
And so um, although it hasn't, um, thankfully, it hasn't had to manifest yet. As I told one of my friends who's an elder, I said, I'd love to be there when you die, but not yet. You know, like I want you to keep living <laughs> selfishly. I want you to stick around. But it's something that Chris and I have talked a lot about is how can we generate interest among young people to provide support for elders at the end of life so that people can not only get the health care they want, but maybe they want their body to remain undisturbed for three days. Maybe they want the Tibetan death instructions read to them. I mean, there's just so many possibilities, but this is not really a thing you ask family to do. These are such specific spiritual instructions, but it's something you could ask your Sangha members to do for you. It's become a bit of a focus for us is how to help people prepare for death and not just your own, but how are you going to help, you know, the other community members? It's very beautiful and um, it's very related to the way communities functioned, you know, before modern society, obviously with that kind of support. And uh, there's an architect who wrote, wrote a great book called A Pattern Language here, uh, Christopher Alexander. And it was, it's actually almost like a Bible. It's like rules of how to make a great society. And one of them was like old people everywhere, <laughs> you know, that, that we shouldn't hide them out hide them away. You know, we need to be integrated communities. So what you're talking about sounds very, very beneficial. Question though, what does that have to do with psychedelics? Yeah. So in 2012, I met a Zen teacher, gave me an instruction. I followed the instruction and had a very spontaneous and disorienting experience of complete dissolution. And it left me, um, in terms of psychiatric language, psychotic, unable to fully function, really struggling with a lot of anxiety and paranoia and distortions of reality. And then I met another Zen teacher who helped me name what that experience was, uh, reoriented me to the breath. And then shortly after that, my sister went in the hospital with advanced stage cancer and died. And in the moments that I was with her, I understood that the thing that had happened to me, this very disorienting experience, had actually shown me how to help someone through the disorienting process of dying. And now you could say, well, what does that have to do with psychedelics? Well, I don't think most people have a spontaneous dissolution experience after hearing a single instruction. I was just still bizarre. I, I can't explain it. I don't know if I was lucky or unlucky. Um so I think, I think that psychedelic experiences can help people tap into both the beauty and the disorientation or fear of nothingness so that everything and nothing. And once you have that glimpse, my belief is it helps you be more present for right. people who are going through a very similar process as their senses become different, as they lose the control over their body, as consciousness changes. So... Yes, meditation could do it on, on its own. We know that. And yet most people are not going to spend the time required to meditate to prepare for their dying moments. So in a way, maybe psychedelics are a little fast track, a little taste of like, what is it like to let go of everything? And then if I practice that enough, maybe it'll be easier for me to help someone else. And I can do it in a way that's not so self-centered. That's my belief. I mean, it's an ongoing experiment. I actually. Um, the place that I live, I see it as an intentional place for people to die. And I have no idea at what point in the future, but um, my hope is that people are getting more and more practice and familiarity with death, including with psychedelics. Um, so that when people want to choose to be in a really peaceful place at their death, there are like five people I know who can say, hey, I'll be there, you know, I'll come help. It's like a it's like Ram Dass. He used to talk about these centers for dying. And he created one around his own death, but that was just one person. So I would like to extend his vision a bit. It's kind of amazing hearing you talk about this because in Tibetan Buddhism, it's a very common practice. Many of us do it even six times a day, rehearsing for your death. And there's a very specific um, program of visualizations that is, that's taught in the teachings called the Bardo in other places. And that's supposed to prepare you for death. And they even say the same sequence, you go through it when you fall asleep. <laughs> Believe it or not, when you sneeze, <laughs> and maybe you know this already, uh, and when you have an orgasm. 
Oh, someone, a Tibetan Buddhist was just telling me these like five different states. <laughs> yeah. So you can, it's actually my favorite meditation. It shows you very precisely what Tibetan Buddhists have seen to be the dissolution of your, your physical and mental factors as you die. And you do it in order to prepare for death. I interview a lot of people and you're probably the first person to talk about that, you know, that I've heard talk about meditation as you know, explicitly is about preparation for death, you know, and this, and this, um, and what you're saying makes a lot of sense that to have that experience, it's, um, it's not that accessible to people, even if they're taught it, they might not actually have the experience. So I like what you're saying a lot that psychedelics could knock someone into that experience. You certainly hear that from people who've had positive psychedelic experiences. They felt both a sense of interconnectedness, like you said, but also a sense that like death's okay. Sure. And you know, the thing is 70% of the people in the Hopkins trials had a mystical experience. But the statistic that people don't know is that a third of people experience their own death. And so if psilocybin can help people experience their own death a third of the time, even when the strong bias is I'm here to have a spiritual experience, that number could actually increase if we said, hey, this is why we're using this. The intention is to practice for your own death. So as soon as you add the intention in, that amplifies the possibility of that particular experience, I think. Um, and I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I tell people, don't go searching for death. Like death will find you if that's part of your, your medicine bag. And for me, death kept finding me. So at some point I said, I better really learn about this because Clearly, people who are at that threshold are asking me to help them, and I better know what I'm doing. And you can't fake it. You know, if someone's dying, they're in the real thing. They can't, they can tell if you're just telling them something like you heard somebody else say, or like, oh, do this particular breath, but you've never done it yourself. So I love what you're saying about practicing those final breaths and practicing the dissolution, because if you then are with someone who's never practiced before, then, and I don't know what you think about this, but there's something that's transmitted when the person who's there with them is able to non-verbally help extend that consciousness state or help extend the instruction. I've experienced this around Buddhist teachers. I don't know how to explain it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be a very highly realized teacher. You know, it happens in you as the practitioner. <laughs> like it doesn't come from the, the teacher. It comes from you and the teacher can awaken it. But we can do it for each other. That's why I like you using the term Sangha because, you know, Sangha ends up, according to my teachers, you know, Sangha ends up being the most important thing because you might only see your teacher once in a while or once ever, but you, but that community that's built up around you is what supports your practice. I have a question for you. The... People listening to this might be getting excited to go <laughs> take psilocybin and, you know, be not afraid of death. What kind of guardrails, what kind of um, practices and support um, do people need in order to have this kind of experience? And, and also what kind of people should watch out for maybe not <laughs> going into this kind of experience? Yeah. <sighs> there are very, let's put it this way, there are very few people when they come to me and say, should I try psilocybin? I say yes. Often I have a series of questions in response to their question. And I ask things like, what kind of uh, work do you do? Could you take two to four weeks off if you really needed to for uh, if something really went wrong? Do you have little children? Do you have someone who can really take care of them day in and day out for a period of time if you need to take care of yourself? Do you have a meditation practice? Do you have any mental health conditions? And are you seeing a health, a mental health professional? Because there are definitely conditions where you wouldn't want to, I don't believe, throw psilocybin in the mix. So um, I know that it's being talked about now as a cure for depression or a new treatment for depression. I still think that the jury's out. I'm not convinced that psilocybin is the right medicine for people with major depression. I think it can help some people, but I also think there's the potential for making things worse. I don't know of many uh, systems in place to take care of people if they've had a bad trip. They're, you know, they're few and far between their individuals here and there, but we don't have 
like a residential facility for folks to live in for six months if their depression gets much worse or they start having more paranoid thoughts or anxiety. Um, like my anxiety after that meditation experience lasted seven months straight. I didn't have little kids to take care of. Thank God. I didn't even have a pet I needed to take care of. Um, I had to keep showing up to work. So um, I can't imagine if I experienced that level of dysfunction with little children, with people who depended on me. And so I asked this series of questions. And then usually if people get to the end of those questions and they still say, this is really important to me, I understand the risks. This is why I'm taking this, you know, this chance. Then I say, okay, where do you want to have the experience? Think about the physical location. Who's there? Who do you trust? Um, ideally, not just paying a stranger to show up and take care of you for the day, but a friend or some a loved one. Um, maybe not someone who cares so much about you that they're going to get all enmeshed in your own process, but someone who maybe you've known for long enough that they can kind of see all your machinations and not get drawn in. Um, and that stops a lot of people too, because they say, oh, I don't have that person in my life. Or my, my best friend is 3,000 miles away. I can't ask them to fly in and hang out with me for a week. Um, and so people end up kind of getting to the end of this series of this interrogation, realizing like, oh, maybe this is kind of a big undertaking. And I'm like, yeah, that's it. And so that's my way of kind of testing people and not to dissuade them, but just to make sure that they're not getting into something that they don't understand. And now I have colleagues who really disagree with me. They're like, oh my gosh, it's such a bummer. Like, you always ask all the questions. You're like, what if you have a heart attack in the middle of the session? Who are you going to call? And they're like, nobody has that. I'm going to say, yes, heart attacks happen under psilocybin. People have died under psilocybin. It's rare, but it happens. So I'm like the, um, you know, I'm like the buzzkill. And I figure if people can kind of get past that threshold, then they're they're very motivated. Um, and I, because you're Tibetan Buddhist, uh, it was Chogyam Trungpa who said, um, you know, if you haven't started meditating, don't, please don't even start. <laughs> but if you started, you have to finish. <laughs> huh. And so what did he mean by finish? Well, I think it's the same with mushrooms. It's like, if you've started, you've opened a door that you can't actually promise what's on the other side. You don't, you can't tell another person how it's going to go. Only they can know. And then they keep finding out more and more, um, which I think is an amazing discovery. Um, but my own path of discovery was not pleasant a lot of the time. It was really hard. So hopefully people hear that and really take it to heart. Like maybe my life isn't that bad. Maybe mushrooms aren't the miracle that I think I need. Maybe I can just look around and try things that are more easily accessible. Yeah, we, we, we call it starting the journey of self-discovery, you know, but from a Buddhist perspective, though, you'd say starting the journey of non-self-discovery, you know, realizing that you actually aren't the, the hard, tight, separate thing you think you are, but then it's a very long journey of kind of unraveling, you know, how to live in the world and whatever you might actually be. <laughs> You're the most conscientious person I've talked to on this topic, so I really, I really, really appreciate it. Because, because from my perspective, it, it seems like there's a lot of risks. And I saw what psychedelics, you know, did to my, my father and so on. And it, it's good things and and bad things, you know. Yeah. It had it had positive opening effects, but it also really kind of knocked knocked them out of you know some of the some beneficial things too. Right. Yeah. Well, thankfully, I became a mom you know, to two kids. And that happily kind of ended a period of a certain kind of exploration for me. And in a way, I mean, the end, the end was created by the beginning because the mushroom experiences were what allowed me to make the changes and connect with a part of myself that really desired to be a mother, mm -hmm. to welcome in that new path of self-discovery. So in a way, it's like the mushrooms just kind of opened a door into something new. And and again, that's I share that so that people understand that the mushrooms are not the end. They're just another teacher. They're another gateway. So as a teacher of mine said, he said, the whole point isn't to when the door opens, you don't stand there admiring the frame, you know, and the artistry of the door. You walk through the door 
And a lot of people, psychedelics become this this thing of this worshiping the doorway. Yeah, it's like the show, the entertainment or something. Uh, I could talk to you for a long, I'm really enjoying talking to you. Uh, but a, a question for you, one of my last questions is whether there's, there's issues of uh, access, socioeconomic status, you know, this is something generally wealthy and whiter people are doing, you know, more than other types of people. Are there variations in access, acceptance, effectiveness of these treatments across like socio socioeconomic um, strata, race, gender, religious beliefs, and so on? Um, that's a big topic, but it's a big topic. Baltimore is a very diverse city, and yet most of our participants were white. They were uh, highly educated. They um, had more access to resources. So even geographically situated in a place where that should have been easy to access was not easy to access. Um, so I think it's a big question. And when all of the research centers, or most of them are run by highly educated, privileged white people, it's a blind spot that we just have to address. And I think people are starting to address it now. Um, I have good friends who, um, a very dear friend, out at UC San Diego, who's a uh, Palestinian American, and he got a huge psilocybin grant. And that's a, a huge step. More women are getting grants to do this research. So I think we're starting to see the increase in diversity. Um, and when the person running the studies isn't of a certain demographic, they're more willing to work hard to get participants through the door. And the participants are willing to meet them where they're at and say, I trust you to go through this kind of wild experience. But the thing I do want to point out is at least with psilocybin, anyone can grow mushrooms. And I, I remember uh, someone who taught me saying something like, oh, well, we can't expect, um, you know, people who don't have a job and can't put food on the table to spend the time to grow mushrooms. And I said, well, why not? Maybe that is the thing that would help direct their intention to a place where they can um, make a very different life choice. So um, it's illegal right now in almost every jurisdiction. So I want to be super clear about that. I'm not encouraging people to break the law, but I'm hoping that there's a lot of um, attempts to change state law to allow what's called home grow or self-treatment. So you could grow a certain amount of mushrooms for your own mental health care, for your own spiritual practice. I'm working really hard in the state of Vermont to make sure that that piece of the conversation isn't left out. When they're talking about what does it mean to bring mushroom medicine to Vermonters, I said, well, a big part of what it means is letting people grow their own mushrooms because people can't pay to get to a big hospital up in Burlington when they live four hours south. Um, most people don't want to leave their house in the winter. It's very cold and snowy. So um, I think mushrooms are kind of the great um, equalizer in that way. You don't need a, a chemist. You don't need a manufacturing license. You don't need a lot of money to create the medicine. Um, they'll grow anywhere. They'll grow in a closet. <laughs> you know, it's quite, it's quite simple. They grow out in the media and outside our house. I've seen people out <laughs> harvesting actually here in Berkeley. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add about um, psychedelics, meditation, and Buddhism? Uh, I think that the Buddhist, at least the American Buddhist community is becoming more open to this concept that potentially there are, um, uh, let's say spiritual supplements that are not intoxicants. And I still think people are going to disagree about whether psychedelics should ever have a part in Buddhism. Um, so I guess what I would maybe request of Buddhists who find the topic of psychedelics to be um, there's no place for that or it's a distraction, it's um, it, it's a detour or, you know, that's not part of my training, just to hold an open mind that potentially there were times in our own Buddhist traditions, back to shamanism, back to the Bon tradition, that um, before there was a formal religion, there were probably people doing something very similar to what psychedelic saga is doing having a practice, combining it with plants, and seeing what happened. On the other side, I would love for more psychedelic people to 
first of all, take less. I don't think the amount of psychedelic use that I'm seeing now is necessary. So partake less and, you know, practice ethics and some spiritual practice more. You know, it's like if we all kind of change our view just a little bit, that here we are in the center where we have a lot in common. And when you say less, do you mean dosage or frequency or both? <laughs> um, I think I mean frequency first and foremost. Um you know, if you're if you're taking a microdose all the time, um, I don't see that as very different than coffee or you know some of these other things that people use to get through the day. Um, and if you're if certainly if you're macrodosing more than you know five times a year, that's probably excessive. And I know those numbers for some people are going to sound annoyingly conservative. And that again, I'm fine being the conservative person, but I've had experiences last. 10 years in terms of their impact in my life. So I know that the fuel is strong enough to last through many, many ups and downs. And sometimes it isn't until you live life that you understand what the lesson was. So you actually have to live the life part <laughs> to get the full gift from the experience. In our next episode, we're going to air in meditation that you've kindly agreed to lead. Sure. But... Uh, could you just describe that a little bit for people listening right now, if you don't mind? Yeah. Um, this was actually a meditation that the, um, I say the mushrooms, I believe they're intelligent. I believe they have agency and intention. So the mushrooms shared with me a way to help others access the space of uh, psychedelics, but from a sober standpoint. So um, I, I've taught this meditation to hundreds of people. It seems very simple, and it's actually um, inspired by a lot of Buddhist practices, but I take people through all of their senses, and they, um, well, they, the only thing they have to have from their past is a specific memory, ideally not a super difficult memory and not a super positive memory, but kind of, you know, a beautiful, um, meaningful time in your life. If you have had a psychedelic experience, you can pick a psychedelic experience, but not one that was just so overcharged that it is hard to differentiate the various sense uh, memories. And then, so I take people through all their five senses and then, um, and then bring those together so that it actually kind of takes people out of their body and then back in. And then when they're back in is when they realize something. It's always mysterious what comes up for people, um, but it's called raft. And it stands for remembering to be aware of your body and trust your experience. Wonderful. Well, I'm looking forward to doing that with you right now and people can listen next week. Well, Catherine, you're exactly the person I've wanted to have on the show about this topic, you know, open-minded, critical, scientific. Thank you so much. I learned you're a welcome. lot from talking to you. Thanks for joining us for our conversation with Dr. Catherine McLean. Next week's episode is a guided meditation that Dr. McLean leads us called RAFT, remembering to be aware of feelings in your body and trust your experience. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider making a donation to our podcast. A Skeptic's Path to Enlightenment is a nonprofit organization. Our podcast is free and ad-free thanks to our generous donors. To support us now, visit our website, at skepticspath.org. We accept cash, credit, Bitcoin, and other cryptocurrencies, and your donations are tax deductible in the U.S. If you'd like to deepen this conversation, please join our private meditation community and newsletter through the links on our website, or follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Thanks to Tara Anderson for producing this episode, Annie Nguyen for editing, Christian Parry for mastering, and Isabella Acebal for marketing. We wish you a wonderful day.